Hello again, folks. Today we're going to be covering section 8.1. Just a quick view of the calendar. Um, you'll notice that, first of all, this video is for Monday, um, June 20th. I originally scheduled uh, 8.1 and 8.2 on the same day, but um, I think it would be better if I just do 8.1 today. So I'm going to, if I can't work 8.2 into tomorrow with 8.3, then I'll just push everything forward one day. All right. So we're just going to do eight one for now. Uh, let me put this aside. The packet that I have for you consists of these pages. This is uh, basically a worksheet. I'm going to uh, draw something, and if you're following along, do duplicate, please, uh, what I draw because I want to illustrate the relationship between uh, circular motion and basically waves. Okay, and this is to help you sort of have a reference um, built up. This is a picture of something called a Scottish yoke. You don't have to print this, but it's an interesting device that basically translates circular motion into reciprocating linear motion. I have a, a GIF that I swiped from the internet that I want to show you. All right. Here's another one of these blank sort of vocabulary sheets. All right. Uh, we're really looking at some version of a transformation model right, for sine and for cosine. So it would be good to know what the letters represent. Let me look it through that. This is much of the same information. Right? This is just uh, nicely, concisely written in your textbook. So I cut and pasted it into this first page here. And then I tried to make sort of a procedure if you were going to try to write the the function from scratch. This would be the order in which you would attempt to do that. Okay. And then there are some examples. Okay, so if you're following along, do print this. All right, and I'll go through it. A um, couple of things. All right. This is uh, basically the overview for chapter eight. All right. Uh, section eight one, namely the subject of today. I better adjust the lights here. There's too much glare. Right. Um, 8 1 is the sine function and the cosine function. And section 8 2 will have been, that's the correct phrase, um, tangent to begin with, and then the other uh, three of the six uh, trig functions. All right, these are known as periodic functions because they repeat into infinity. All right, uh, for, uh, into positive infinity, into negative infinity, uh, which is why they're modeled models for light, electromagnetic radiation. All right. Anyhow, um, I'm going to hold off on that for today and just focus on these two because there's a lot to sort of assimilate. Section 8.3, whether it gets covered tomorrow or on Wednesday, is um, an inverse, examples of inverse trig functions. And in that instance, you have to actually chop the waveform to a narrower frame, all right? Otherwise, it will not, uh, it will not uh, pass the one-to-one uh, -one, uh, horizontal uh, uh, line test, okay? So that's an overview of chapter eight, all right? Let me show you something. Um, get this out of the way first. That I made, and then if it fails, or even if it does work, I'm going to show you an animated GIF. Because right, this is kind of interesting, I think. All right. Um, that thing that you saw, all right, uh, which again, it's a, it's a diagram of something in engineering. It's a device. Anybody could make this. In theory, you could either make it from scrap, as you'll see that I have, uh, or with a, th a 3D printer. There is this device known as a Scotch yoke. All right, and if you can imagine this is a wheel that is rotating and that's a pin that is held in place. Um, as the circle, uh, circular motion rotates, uh, whether clockwise or counterclockwise, this uh, sort of uh, circuit here, I'm trying to think of what it would be like, uh, the hippodrome, <laughs> a racetrack, if you will, right? Uh, translates uh, motion uh, this way, all right? Reciprocating back and forth, left and right. All right, it's kind of cool. All right, I, uh, during the early stages of the pandemic, I had a lot of free time on my hands, right? We were all trapped in the house, right? So uh, what I did was, I, I sort of just was playing around with the garbage that I had, which is, was uh, 
Uh, call it board, mostly. Although this is uh, some kind of like skewers I had in my, uh, my cutlery drawer. What I wanted to do was basically make something that draws waves. All right, it's not really functional right now, uh, mostly for the reason that I can't secure the paper well enough. But what I wanted to do was basically um, have this arranged so that I could draw um, while rotating this wheel I have right here. Hopefully that's better. All right. What I'd like to do eventually, if I find the time, um, is either get a crank on the bottom of this, make another one of these uh, wheels, or uh, maybe even work in a transistor so it can be adjustable, the speed of the paper. All right. But what I'm going to try to do right now is use a marker, incidentally, which uh, I'm going to use to draw, all right, and a little holster, if you will, all right. If all goes according to plan, all right, uh, if I pull on this lever, this is a, what do you call it, a, a dimmer switch wheel, the circular motion by way of an improvised scotch yoke um, will translate the circular motion into linear motion, all right. Now, it doesn't make a lot of uh, satisfying drawing yet. Here you have just a line from its back and forth motion. But if I had an assistant, all right, it would be cool. Um, what I would do is have someone pull on this piece of paper until the day that I finally fix this. And you will see that it forms a wave rather than just a, a line. So um, if you humor me, and they kind of have no choice, right? Um, I'm gonna try to uh, get this to work. All right, so uh, we'll see how bad this comes out. All right. Um, it's running out of paper. All right. I made this paper out of sheets of, uh, uh, which calls it, graph paper that I taped together. That's how desperate it was. Anyhow, as you can see, Right. I could get it close enough. What was a straight motion, right, unraveled over time forms, uh, sort of looks like a heart, uh, what do they call that, a mammogram, not a mammogram, a mon um, you know, something that detects your heartbeat, right? Um, you see that this actually forms waves, right, as it is unfurled, right? Now, the reason it's sucky looking, all right, is because it's not being pulled at a consistent rate, all right, unfortunately. And it's not too dark either, I'm sad to say. But I think you get the idea, all right? Essentially, circular motion um, can be expressed as linear motion and vice versa. One is translatable essentially into the other. Let me roll this back up if I can. Um, just because I'm a little worried, I'll show you the GIF that I mentioned. Is that rather it be crystal clear than not? Okay. Let me just get this back in order here, and it will be going into my crawl space and never seen again. <laughs> This is what happens when you get trapped in the house during the pandemic. You start making uh, uh, weirdo sort of uh, garbage uh, devices here, like this. It was a fun mental exercise, what can I say? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, being a twit because I just wanted to go back together nice and neat, as neat as it possibly can. Uh, this is why it's, uh, shall we say, a permanent work in progress. Yeah. Fair enough. All right, let me get this out of here, and then I'll show you the, the nice animation instead. All right. uh, and to that, in that event, I should probably adjust my lighting. So that it's visible. Yeah. Let's turn on the projector here. Yeah. Okay. That is 
very blurry. Um, is it aimed correctly? I promised that I would give the animator credit, so this GIF that I have here, and I'll probably make this available in Canvas. This was made by a fellow named Hugo Escocase, E S C O C, accent marked E S, Escocase. Uh, no disrespect if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, anyhow, this is basically what I was aiming at. Isn't that neat? Alright. Anyone could build something like this in theory. Alright. Um, and in, in the early Industrial Revolution, I imagine this is when this was invented, um, the Scotch yoke, right? It was used uh, to produce, you know, uh, some sort of... Uh, Mill work, you know, uh, some kind of clockwork motion, if you will, right? right? You could, in theory, if you were pulling on the device in the linear fashion, cause the wheel to crank. Or if you were cranking the wheel, you could cause this to oscillate back and forth, right? The point is, circular motion can be translated into linear motion, right? And that is really the subject of sines and cosines. So let me show you this diagram, which I have made, uh, and I'll fill this in with you. Okay, here's the whole kit and caboodle. All right. It would be good, uh, pause this, this is a little bearing. It would be good in the long run to commit to memory uh, certain features of this. All right. That's fine. All right. So, here's what we do. Right. If you were to take a unit circle, all right, which means what? It means that the radius from here to here would be equal to one. All right, and even if it were at this position up here, this dot would still be r equals one in terms of y as opposed to in terms of x, and rotated to here, r would still be equal to one, and rotated to here, r would be equal to one, and so on, all right? If you wanted to, as in the case of my uh, failed uh, graph paper, Take the circular motion and express it as um, a function of time, in which case you just change the variable from x to t. Um, the wave pattern that you would get from right here forward would look something like this. It would have, at each of these points around the circle, um, those um, points in time, right? Now, it's a little weird to think of time expressed in terms of pi, but that's exactly what we do in math world, right? So this is zero pi, or just say zero, right? And instead of pi over two, you could say 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270, and 360, right? Well, at this point, this point, this increment, and that one, we're gonna fill in the same information, right? So just mark it here, uh, pi over two, right, as in 90, and this point here, uh, just pi, right, and then at this point more here, 3 pi over 2, and at this point 2 pi. And it would go beyond that, in theory it could go in the other direction as well. The ceiling and the basement on this motion, all right, would be dictated by the radius. So if it's a unit circle, therefore the radius is 1, the height of the wave would be no bigger than 1, all right. That's why this is a dashed line here. All right, and a dashed line here. Here's how the wave would unravel. All right, at zero, zero, it's in exactly the same place as it is on the circle, all right? But at the point of 90 degrees in linear forward motion, you'd have a dot here, so put a dot right there, all right? And then as it rotates down this way, all right, to 180, you'd be at zero again, all right? 
And as it continues along and can, uh, it goes to 270 degrees, or 3 pi over 2, it would hit the, uh, the basement here. All right, and then uh, back at zero, otherwise known as two pi, you'd be on zero again, all right? Essentially, um, these are the main points, all right? Zero, pi over two, pi, three pi over two, and two pi that you want in the long run to commit to memory, all right? If I filled in the spaces in between, you'd see a clock like this, all right? And then down like this. And then it would continue indefinitely because it's a periodic function meaning it follows a pattern indefinitely. Now this is still a function, in spite of the curviness, all right, because it would pass the vertical line test. All right? However, at this stage, it would not have an inverse because it would, be, it would fail the horizontal line test, which is why when we get to inverses in section A3, something has to be done. Basically, the frame has to be cut to a narrower uh, spectrum. All right. Anyhow, this much of the waveform, right, that is starting at zero, zero, the origin is the function known as the sine of x. And the x values are really um, these points on the circle, right, which you can think of as an expression of time somehow. going to say. Uh, it just so happens that in terms of the symmetry of this, you know, remember um, horizontal symmetry, uh, symmetry about the origin, this is an example of an odd function. This is an odd function because it has symmetry about the origin. Right. Do you remember what that means? It means essentially that if reflected um, let's see, over y-axis and then over x-axis, it would look the same uh, before and after. Right? So if you took this waveform and reflected it here and then flipped it over the x-axis, it would be the same wave before and after. So the, uh, the abbreviation for that is to say it has symmetry about the origin, or you could simply call it an odd function. The class example would be something like the cubic function, x to the third, right? The staying alive, all right? In terms of its domain, the x values, right? The domain, what is x that is allowed, would be anything from negative infinity into positive infinity, all right? In interval notation. The range, on the other hand, is restricted. It is between negative one and positive one in the case of the unit circle. Right? Why? Because that is as much of a height or of a depth as it can have. Right? It ping pongs, if you will, uh, between the maximum and the minimum, the extrema of negative one and positive one. Okay, so that's an abbreviation. Again, the book has this information, right, uh, which for our purposes I swiped here. Um, you could just have it here in this block if you're interested. All right. Nonetheless, um, try to memorize this much of the waveform of sine, namely where it starts. It's very important. Right? It starts at the origin if it's a true sine. All right? And um, it ends at 2 pi. That's it's what you would refer to as its period, right? One complete wave, right, in that time frame. Right. Now, when we get to cosine, and I'm going to put it underneath here, right, you'll see that it is remarkably similar. But it starts in a different place. So I'm going to erase this. gobbledygook out of the way, and we'll continue. All right. Now, um, in the case of cosine of x, um, what is different about 
cosine from sine is that, I'll put it here just for the lack of space, sine and cosine are out of phase by pi over 2, or you could say 90 degrees, right? Meaning that they're basically the same shape, but they start in different places. They start cosine in particular already 90, 90 degrees ahead, right? So if you were to take the same unit circle and consider as this is unraveled in counterclockwise motion like so, from 0 to pi over 2 to pi to 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, 90, 180, 270, 360. Um, being that it is out of phase officially, the cosine would start right there. Right? Not. So it's not at 0, 0. Right? It starts over here technically. Um, on the uh, y-axis, which would be what? Uh, zero, uh, one. Right. Then, all right, um, as it moves along, it goes to zero again, and then to here, this is still uh, pi over two, this is still pi, this is still three pi over two, and this is still two pi, 90, 180, 270, 360, right? But at a point of zero, it's um, already up here. All right. So put dots in these respective places. I'll put this in red just to make it a little bit more obvious. All right, dot there at the ceiling of one. And then right on the axis at 90 degrees, all right? And then at negative one, and then at zero again. This is periodic. And then at... Um, one again for a two pi, right? The form would look like this. It's the same wave as I mentioned, but it's out of sync, it's out of phase, we say, right? And this would continue that way, and in theory it would continue down that way. Um, it's out of phase by 90 degrees, all right? So no sine starts here, and cosine starts here. And what the values would be which are either going to be 0 or negative 1, depending upon where you're located and whether you have a sine or a cosine. The benefit of this is that it helps you make predictions when um, asked, what, you know, what's the sine of 90 degrees? All right, um, here's a calculator just to show you what I mean. All right, because you ha I have this committed to memory, all right, if you ask me what's um, cosine of 2 pi, I could tell you that it's positive 1. All right, so just to prove a point, all right, um, here's cosine, and I'm entering this in radians, so I'll put it like that. Cosine of 2 pi is, because of the graph, positive 1. Here you see it is, positive 1. All right. It's not that you can't use your calculator, of course, but it helps to have a frame of reference. Is the only reason I'm bothering you about this. Anyhow, just as sine is an example of an odd function, it has a symmetry about the origin. It turns out that cosine is an even function. All right? As in the case of y equals x squared, that example of a parabola. All right? It has symmetry, uh, horizontal symmetry, you would say. That's if it was reflected over the y-axis only. Right. So if you took this and you flipped it over the y-axis, it would look exactly the same before and after. Um, okay. Let's see what else is there. Um, in terms of the domain, all right, I moved this, didn't I? All right. The domain, what the x's are allowed to be, is still from negative infinity to positive infinity. It'd be anything as a periodic function. Um, however, uh, similar to sine, the maximum that the y value could be and the minimum that the y value could be are restricted to, in the case of the unit circle, 
uh, negative one to positive one. It does include those numbers, so brackets instead of parentheses. All right. Again, this is all summarized elsewhere. It's just good to build up the frame of reference. Okay. All right, let's get to the terminology that would be good to know. Here's this sheet uh, for collecting phrases and symbols that would be good to recognize. transformation models from early in the semester. Um, it depends, you know, whether you're dealing with uh, polynomial or rational um, or uh, even logarithmic function, right? But it, it incorporates these values. The function of x uh, is equal to plus or minus the a value at the front. Uh, plus or minus the b value times x minus h is the degree plus k. All right, that was the original model for transformation way back in I want to say chapter three. All right, and at the time, all right, these concepts were introduced. All right, there was um, the sign up in the front would dictate whether it was vertically reflected, right. um, or in the normal orientation, as in the case of positive or vertically stretched, right? So this value was important. There was a horizontal stretch or compression value, the B value. And then these, the H value here and the K value here, were the things that caused translation, so a shift uh, horizontally or vertically, all right? Anyhow, a couple of things to bear in mind. Remember this, that um, the horizontal shift is counterintuitive. Right. Normally when we see a positive, we think, okay, something moves uh, horizontally uh, towards the right, but if, if you see a negative, that's exactly what happens, right? It's backwards, right? counterintuitive. Now, the adapted version of this pertaining to sines and cosines would look like so. Right. Um, You'd have either, and I use capital letters instead, A sine of BX minus C plus D, which I think makes it a little bit more obvious what they are, that these are a job, basically, of transformation. And if not sine, then cosine. Now, depending upon whether you're a physicist or a, a you know purist math person, all right, you may refer to these things a little slightly differently, but um, this is essentially what they do. All right, let's talk about um, the a value. I'll put that here. All right, and then I'll put this in a different color, uh, something known as p period, and then the horizontal stretch factor. B, and then something called the uh, horizontal shift, C, and then, I wish I had another color, but I don't, so I'll use red, uh, something known as the midline, D. Right. What these letters pertain to, we'll explain, right, and have basically as a reference, all right, there's a little formula that will go with some of these as well, all right. A is the first thing, all right? A is the first. Um, this is known as the amplitude. All right, you can think of it in, um, in the classic transformation model as the vertical stretch. Right. 
it is the same idea. Vertical stretch or compression. Factor, as in the traditional perspective of it. However, um, basically it's the height of the wave. from what is known as something called the midline. Right. If there's a negative in front of it, it just means that it's vertically reflected as in the traditional model as well. I hope that this light is screwing things up. Um, I just want to make it as legible as it possibly can. All right. This is the height of the wave, the amplitude. All right. And it's, it's fairly intuitive. If you have a whole number there, uh, it'll make the wave taller, right? If you have something that is a fraction, i.e. something between zero and one, it will make the wave squat, okay? And negatives make things flip, right? Um, the midline, which is also down here, right? I'll get to that first. It is basically, the middle of the wave. Right? Under normal circumstances, what that means is the midline is uh, usually uh, y equals zero, right? otherwise known as the x-axis. That's in the way. Ooh. This one my projection, sorry. Okay. Do this again. As long as that's not in the way. Okay. Right. We measure the amplitude from either above or below the um, the midline. Uh, let's see. All right. Um, let's talk about P. P is not part of either of these transformation models, right? But it is intimately uh, integral uh, in its importance, right? This is not, especially the waves. This is known as the period, right? The period is basically the amount of time, which in the context of waves is going to be pi, the amount of pi, if you will, it takes to complete one full wave cycle. Right. For sine and for cosine, and this does vary with the, um, the type of trig function, this is usually 2 pi. Right? So just like the midline is usually at the y equals 0 or x-axis line, the period is, at least to start with, before you start mutating it or changing it somehow, is usually 2 pi. That's the amount of pi it would take to complete a wave. Those two drawings from earlier were from 0 to 2 pi on purpose. Sorry, I'm hesitating here. This B value, and I hope that this shows up as green is always a problem, is essentially um, the number, how's that looking? Looks like it's okay. The number of complete waves in the period. So how many can you squeeze in, right? Normally it's just one, 
right? But if the you know if the if there's a transformation somehow, there's some distortion. It may be like as you have a sque a compression, a horizontal compression, you might get more complete waveforms as a greater frequency. You would say, all right, um, in the same time frame, in the same amount of pi, right, or less if that's the, the circumstance. Is that visible? I'll read it. The number of complete waves in the period, right? And that really depends on the problem. This is um, probably from a, a more familiar perspective. This is the horizontal stretch or compression factor. Uh -oh. Sleep. All right, just like amplitude is really the vertical stretch compression factor. Factor. Something you multiply by. All right. I think in the context, if my memory is correct, in the context of physics, what this would be, uh, it is the easy, if not if not the frequency per se, then it would be the angular speed. I'll take this with a grain of salt. Um, I believe it is the angular speed. So akin to omega. Right. For our purposes, let's just think of it as in the traditional transformation context, the horizontal stretch or compression factor. Okay. And then there's something known as the uh, the horizontal shift, right? Or the Phase shift. For C, right? Horizontal shift. Same difference. All right. Um. This is going to be kind of awkward to say this, but I think it's good advice anyway. When it comes to the phase shift, right, for especially if you have to do this by hand, right, think of this as being as being the start of the wave. That's a little silly to say that because a wave is infinite. But I mean in comparison to the model that we drew earlier. If sine normally starts at zero, zero, right? It really goes past it in the uh, negative infinity direction and well beyond it in the positive infinity, infinity direction. But if you can think of it as being more or less the start of the wave, zero, zero, then the C value, the phase shift horizontally, would be where it starts when it's transformed. So we'll help you to have when you're trying to draw something. So think of it as being the start of the wave. I think that's the most practical way to think about it. Okay. Now there are, as I mentioned, some formulas here that would be good to know. Um, the amplitude can be calculated like this. The absolute value would be equal to one half the A value amplitude is equal to so little space. Sorry, the maximum minus the minimum in absolute value. So you just want the magnitude times a half. So if you know what from reading a graph, what the maximum is, the top, the crest of the amplitude, and the minimum, which is more or less the valley, right? Um, it's complementary opposite, right? And you subtract those. And then you establish the magnitude, uh, just pretend it's positive, um, and multiply it by half, you can get the amplitude instead. Right. You can just stare at where the midline is and kind of calculate it ordinarily, but if you just had numbers, that would work. Right. The period, in the case of 
um, sine and cosine at least, all right, would be given by this. Um, it's equal to two pi, because that's usually what it is, over the absolute value of b. The horizontal stretch or compression factor, all right, let's free up some space here, um, is basically that rearranged. So the absolute value of b would be 2 pi over the period. Um, and C, um, if it's written in this form, it's pretty straightforward, but sometimes it's in the factored form, and that is to your benefit. Um, so what I want to put here is the factored version of it which is to have it as C over B. Right. If the B is just 1, then it would just be C anyway. And the midline has a similar formula to the amplitude, but um, it's really more or less an average. All right. D is equal to the maximum plus the minimum, as opposed to subtracting it, divided by 2. So you get the halfway. All right. Just make that distinction. These are absolute value lines and a subtraction. And this is just dividing by 2 after the sum. So more or less an average. All right. Again, all of this information, if you feel a little bit more comfortable rather than my writing it, all right, it's on this first sheet. All right. I think the only thing that's left out via the textbook was maybe this. All right. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to add one other thing to this, because I think it might be helpful later. start of the wave is the C value, right? Um, if in theory you wanted to find the end of the wave, right? in theory that would be the C location plus the period. So whatever you calculate the period to be, if this is where you're starting, the period is how, you know, where the wave would, uh, how long it takes for the wave to complete in terms of pi. Um, that should give you the end of the wave in theory. Okay. Put this back. Let's see if I can do some examples now. Let me turn this off. Get the bulb. I'll erase this. Ooh, the green isn't always in there. Blue is erasing nicely, the green is tenacious. Given the information, let's do some um, some examples. Right. Um, if you had to identify the period you know, of this function, the sine of pi over 6 times x. You might compare it to the transformation model from earlier 
and you'll see what is there and what is missing. In this event, right, um, there is what appears to be a B value. So what do we have? We have a horizontal stretch or compression factor known as B, and it is in fact pi over 6. All right. Can we use that to calculate the period? Yes. All right. The period is equal to Uh, in the case of sine or cosine, 2 pi over the absolute value of b. So what you're going to end up with is something of a complex fraction if you just substitute the value of pi over 6 in here. All right. And I'll put it to superimpose it. Uh, pi over 6, right? Realize that this is division. And that you can alternatively write it uh, sort of horizontally rather than stacked on itself. So that would be 2 pi divided by uh, pi over 6, right? And remember, when you're dealing with fractions, the old thing is um, heat change flip. That's a very stylized K. Heat change flip. If that table is in the way, I'll move it again. Let me see if I can lower this a little bit. Um, so keep this, think of it as 2 pi over 1, change this to multiplication, flip it upside down, 6 would be up here, pi would be down there. And then there is a, a cross cancellation effect, right? The pi symbols uh, would cancel, and then it would just be 2 times 6, which means that the period would be 12, right? Now you might wonder, 12 but, you know, don't worry about it, it's a decimal. Because pi is more or less, think about things as a measure of time, not in terms of seconds, but in terms of a decimal, you might say, then that's just many times of pi, right? So um, along the x-axis, right, if pi is 3.14, 12.0, right, would be further down the pike. Right? So significantly further down. Right. Don't worry about it. It's just a decimal number. Okay? All right. Let's um, do another. But based upon a drawing. Let's identify the amplitude now. Uh, from a graph. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to draw something All right, from scratch. I'll try to give it as much detail as I possibly can. I'll try to make it nice and neat. I'm going to leave these increments uh, in the familiar type. So this first increment will be pi over 2, and this will be pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi, and then it would be the equivalent of beyond that by another 90 degrees. All right. And back here, you could make this if you went in the opposite direction, negative 2 pi, uh, negative pi over 2, and then negative pi. And then along the horizontal, pardon me, the, uh, the vertical axis could be a different increment. I'll have it like that, just to try to make it consistent if I can help it. This will be one, two, three, four, 
a negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. Make it a little bit narrow, bro. And I'll put in this wave. I'll put green just because of the contrast somewhat. All right. At negative pi over two, I'll have a dot here. And then at negative pi, I'll put a dot down here. So you can see this is rather tall already. Then at, at through the origin, so zero, zero. And then at positive pi over two, I'll put the reflection here. Uh, something like that. And then pi, three pi over two, up to four again. And then down here. And you'll have a wave, basically, to give the crudity of this drawing. Like that. Right. I would argue right, that this is uh, similar to standard sine wave. Right. Why? Just for the reason that because it at least seems to start a wave. Right. I know that there's more of it this way and more of it potentially that way, but it goes through the origin, right? It goes through what well, starts, you can think of at zero, zero. Right? I know that that is silly to say that, but if you're looking at that much of the picture. Right? All right. Anyhow, you can tell, although the picture is not that great, all right, Um, that this is a little bit taller than it was from the model introduced earlier, where it just went up to one and, and down to negative one. Now I would add this, it's similar to a sine wave, but a sine wave reflected vertically, all right? Like so, because it would be normally like this. All right, if I were to superimpose this black, sine wave, although it's not as nice to look at because it's a little bit squat on purpose. All right, that's what a standard sine would look like, all right, in this scale, all right? And here you see that it's um, flat, flipped upside down and elongated, all right? So you could just read the scale. If it's still going through what appears to be the midline of y equals zero, otherwise known as the x-axis, all right, then it hasn't been vertically shifted, it's been vertically reflected. And you can just read the amplitude that way, all right? Or from zero up, all right, either way. Um, I would fall back on the, the equations, though, just to be careful, all right? Even if I want to predict that the amplitude is equal to four, and in theory, it would be negative four for the reason that it's vertically reflected. All right. Let us do the calculation. All right. The amplitude would be equal to one half the max minus the min in absolute values. The maximum, as long as this is consistent, goes from zero up to four. All right. So there'd be a four here. And the minimum goes from zero down to four, right? Up to four and then down to four again, right? So there is a, a minus four here and there's a minus in the, uh, in the formula, right? So what happens when you have a double negative? It ends up being a positive, in which case it's four plus four. And that's the absolute value of eight, right? Which is really just eight and then eight times a half is in fact four, right? The formula will give you the magnitude, right? You have to decide whether it's a negative four one based upon whether it seems that it's different uh, from the model from earlier. So since it appears to be upside down in addition to being stretched, then you would say it's negative.
if you're looking for you know the, to complete the equation. Otherwise, that is sufficient. Right? That's the amplitude regardless. Okay. All right. Let me uh, turn back on my projector, and I want you to, uh, if you're following along, to highlight certain details from the uh, handouts. Take a look at this. Okay. This is the same information uh, that I've been discussing. Perhaps better. I'll leave that to you to decide. Um, but this pertains to the characteristics of sine and cosine function. All right. All right. Remember, sine is an odd function technically, and cosine is an even function. Um, what is worthy of being saved from here? Uh, it's the same information, but this is the horizontal shift. Right, good to know. And D is the vertical shift. So I would have that uh, encapsulated. All right, here's the amplitude formula that I mentioned. Uh, that's technically the vertical stretch compression, if you're interested in calling it that. And um, this is how to calculate period right, for sin uh, sinusoidal functions of the type that are either sine or cosine. All right. What's good about this that's a little bit down further is a procedure, um, uh, if you're given a sine function or a sinusoidal function with a phase shift and a vertical stretch, uh, pardon me, and a vertical shift, all right, uh, here's how you might go about it. All right, identify the amplitude first. I mean, you express it in the what they call the general form here, the transformation model, either sine or cosine. Identify the A, identify the period, identify the phase shift. Right, and then draw the graph, uh, shift it to the right and or left and up or down by D. If you are given a graph and you have to write a function, um, I, I added this myself. All right. You would start by choosing a model. which is either going to be basically what you see in green or in red here. All right, they're the same except for the fact that this is a sine or a cosine, right? Here's again the logic. If you could tell that the graph, a complete wave, begins pretty much at the origin, and probably go with sine because it'll be easier. It's not that you can't do it the other way, it's just that it might make it a lot harder, all right? If on the other, on the other hand it doesn't go through the origin, if it's something else, maybe go with cosine. Um, then follow things in this order. Look for the midline first, all right? In which case it would be, again, the max of the min, and you would just divide it by two, all right? And then you could put that in the formula, all right? Then look for the amplitude, all right, which would be the same max and min, but uh, subtracted and then cut in half, and then you could put that in place of A. And then look for the horizontal stretch or compression factor, all right? You could start with uh, identifying uh, what the period is and 
dividing 2 pi by that actual period. All right? Now, here's a factored version of bx minus c, right, where the b value has been factored out. All right? When you're trying to fill in the, uh, the function to author it, to write it, right, think of this as the starting point of a complete wave cycle in the drawing. All right, what you've calculated, all right, or that location where you see it, all right, all right, and then look for what the x coordinate would be, all right. And once you've uh, done the calculation, you could write it as just c here. And then there's the examples that I'm going to show you in a little bit. Let me turn this off now, and I'll do another couple of examples with you. And put this in the There you go. That's a little bit I hate tinkering with the lights, but it really is necessary. Um, let's do this. Right, we're going to identify now um, the uh, phase shift, right, which is the same as the horizontal shift. Right, basically, we're looking for the start of complete wave. That position known as uh, C. All right. Given this example, all right. If you have a function and it's a sine function, and then the guts look like this: x plus pi over six, and I'm sweeping this in here plus two. If it helps, compare it to the model. So I'll put this in red here. And you can see whether it's the factored version of this or not. Sine of bx uh, plus or minus c normally plus 2d. OK. All right. Now, the phase shift is controlled by where what is c. All right. What is sitting in c in this position, in this situation, is that number, right? Pi over six. All right. All right. It's probably unnecessary, but um, B is part of the problem sometimes because it is the horizontal stretch or compression right. that has bearing on the drawing. All right, but B in this case is just the number one. So if B is equal to one, then C over B, although it is in fact it, would end up being like this. Pi over six. Now do remember, it's, this is unfortunate, the C value like H from uh, the earlier incarnations of transformation is counterintuitive, right? Remember, the sign is counterintuitive. Right. So if you see a negative C, all right, that would be um, the C value itself would be positive. If you see a positive C, essentially, that would make this a negative, pi over 6. Okay. To simplify this, since you're really just dividing by 1, C is equal to negative pi over 6. What this means, essentially, is that 
uh, the complete waveform, one complete waveform, begins at negative pi over 6. Okay. So you're going to shift left. Right. The wave would be backwards slightly. All right. In terms of a picture, here's a very simple sketch. Um, I'm going to leave this out of the conversation right now because we're not actually looking for the uh, midline. But if the wave normally, right, for a sign is something that would look like that, right, and mind you, this is uh, x equals zero, all right, negative pi over six would be somewhere back here, pi over six which means that the wave, although not distorted by the horizontal compression factor, this is just one, it would be at least backward that much, shifted backward. On top of that, it would be ending up a little bit higher because it's positive two. So, um, the midline, rather than being uh, if this is one here, hypothetically, if the midline is normally zero, instead it would be a positive two. Um, the wave would be scooted up on top of it. So you'd have a wave that basically looks something like this. It's not really distorted per se. Right? It's not stretched or squashed by a horizontal compression factor because the B is just one. But it's scooted back, it's horizontally shifted backward by negative, the amount of negative pi over six. And remember that this is a decimal, it's just 3.14 divided by six, so something tiny, right? And then shift it up, right? Now, what would be good maybe is to implement the calculator at this point. Here's standard sine of x. All right. So you get a better picture. This is a little distorted, this image. I'm gonna play with the zoom just a bit. I'm going to go to just uh, C standard initially, but that looks a little squat, right? Incidentally, the mode is in radians right now. Uh, what you might do is in zoom, tinker with the screen dimensions here. So there is a Different options here. I believe one of them is for trig. Here's the Z trig. Try that one. That's a little bit nicer. All right, here's your standard thing. Bear in mind, these increments are still for the standard uh, sign. That would be pi over two pi, three pi over two, and the edge of the screen would be two pi, all right? But if you hit trace and you wanted to get anywhere, bear in mind, it's gonna give you the decimal equivalent. So if you wanted to go to say, uh, x is equal to pi, which is right there, and it will tell you that y is equal to zero. All right, it's going to give you the decimal equivalent of pi, 3.14159, whatever it is. All right, anything else would be a fraction of that. All right, like if you went back to here, um, pi over 2 would be 1.57 or something like that. So if you did 90 degrees, say, uh, let's see, pi divided by 2 for 90 in radian form, you have 1.57, right? And then your y value is positive one. Now, if this prediction is correct, right, because it is shifted, right, I'm gonna superimpose the sine wave 
all right? So that it's back a little bit, and then in theory it would be up, all right? At uh, the midline of positive two, because of the D value here. So uh, go back here, and then just add those little features. So sine of x plus pi over two, uh, pi over six rather, x, and that's a positive. And then I like, again, not to be a twit, but I like the uh, intuitive way of entering this as a fraction. All right, so I'm gonna put second and then pi, and put a two down here, scoot on out of here, close the parentheses, and then put plus two. And we'll see how this graphs. All right, it will be superimposed, so. Here you have, there you go, a little bit further up, right? Now, if you want to, just to confirm, all right, if this is the starting point, negative pi over six, all right, I'm gonna hit trace, all right, and what it should give me at negative pi over six is um, two is the answer would be right here for the y value, right, rather than zero, right? So let me try trace. Uh, and I want to get up to that one, so I'm going to scoot it on up. Okay, let's put in uh, negative, I'm going to use this button, and then second pi divided by 6. All right, and if all goes according to plan, y should be equal to 2 for this top one. All right. Hmm. Point, what is that? 0.52. Oh, yeah, because it's pi over 6. I'm sorry. All right. 2.8. All right. All right. Oh, you know what? I must have typed it in the wall, didn't I? Yeah, I did. I'm sorry. Because I'm reading it backwards, I put a 2 here when I should have put a 6. I'm sorry. I'm wondering why this is goofy. There you go. Uh, it looks the same when you're looking at it from uh, backwards. That's a six. Sorry. All right. Now hit graph. That looks a little bit better. All right. Should be two. All right. So stick to itiveness here. All right. Trace. Scoot up to that one. All right. Now I'm going to enter again negative the second pi divided by six dopey, not the other way around. All right. Um, now hit enter. Y is two, All right. as predicted. All right. Because it shifted back. That's you could think of this as more or less the starting point, instead of the starting point being the origin. The complete wave would begin here. All right, and it cycles through, all right? So the midline, instead of it being y equals zero, is two instead. All right, now in theory, I know that I didn't ask you this, but it's worthy of consideration. At this point here, negative pi over six, and then positive two, that's that dot, if you will. The end point, this is the start of the wave, more or less. The end point would be also shifted back. Now normally, um, you could figure out probably a couple of different ways, but um, if two pi, because it's not distorted this wave, is normally where something ends, all right? And that is, in fact, the period, all right? Uh, you could subtract uh, pi over six from two pi to figure out what the x value would be here, and then in theory, it would also be here, just shifted up, all right? Um, but if you figure out what the starting point is, 
right? And then you add the period, in any case, just to generalize, it should give you the exact same value, all right? What does that mean? In this case, the starting point is, again, negative pi over 6, right? This would be equal to the end point. It isn't really ending there because it's an infinite wave, all right? But one complete wave cycle, all right, is what I'm talking about. So plus the period of 2 pi, all right? Being that the calculator is in radians, you can enter these in radians, and it would tell you what that location would be. So let's do that real quick. All right. Here's negative pi divided by 6 plus 2 pi. Right. Add it. It gives you the decimal equivalent. So 5.7... Uh, six almost, right? If you did it in the rational style, let's see if I can get it to do that. No, that's unfortunate. All right, I'm gonna do it brute force then because I'm just temperamental. Um, you'd have to translate two pi into a common denominator of six, all right? Um, if the denominator was 1, to change it to 6, you'd have to multiply by 6, which means that you'd have to multiply the top 2 by 6 as well, which would make this 12, right? And therefore, these are now like terms. Negative 1 plus 12, right, would be positive 11. 11 with pi over 6, right? That should be what that decimal of 5.7 is. So... Um, 11, shoot, right. Yep, same decimal, all right. Remember that 11 pi over 6. If you go back to the graph, all right, and you wanted to figure out where the end point of the wave is, if this is a sign, um, and this is more or less the starting point here, all right, if you think about it that way, then the end of the wave would be somewhere around here, all right? Trace. And then you could tell because it would have the same uh, y value. So if the y value starts at 2, then it should end at 2. All right. So uh, let's see, trace. Go up to the top one. And then I'm going to put in 11 second pi divided by 6, and it should spit out 2 just to confirm you. Yeah. It does. Very good. Okay, that's the end of the wave. You could think of it that way. Okay. All right. Um... Okay, what if you had to do a bunch of things at the same time? Um, identify Uh, the midline, the period, or the amplitude, the period, and the phase shift. Right, which is essentially um, Midline is the D value, amplitude is the A value, period is P, and the phase shift would be the C value. Right. C may end up being part of this trouble anyway. Uh, pardon me, the letter B. Right. Given this function. The function is equal to 1A 
half cosine of x over 3 minus pi over 3. And in comparison to the model, you can see what is present and what is not. A cosine in this case, bx minus c plus d. There is apparently um, no d value here. So the midline would be 0. So it's more or less the normal situation. It's not vertically shifted. All right. The amplitude would be a in this case, so it's a half. That means that it's uh, shorter than normal. Uh, and the period, well, we'd have to calculate that. The period is equal to 2 pi over b, an absolute value. Right? The b value is a little disguised right now. If you put this in factored form, it might be more obvious. All right, factored form is ripping the B out of, away from the X, parking on, on the outside of a parentheses. And then in the, just to get away with it, you'd have the same effect on the C value. So in the model, it would be that you'd have to account for that by putting a B here, all right, to be left with C if you redistribute. All right, anyhow, um, to rip the b value away from x essentially means that uh, b is one third. Right? All right, the, the top of this, is, since it is not written, would have to be one. Just factoring it would be putting the one third out in front of it right? and leaving the x behind. The effect on the uh, value here, right, coincidentally, would be that there'd be a pi left over in the factored form. Okay, so putting those pieces in here to calculate the period, we see that, uh, well, you know what, I'll just superimpose it. It's one third. One third would go down here. It's going to be positive regardless. And then you have something again of a complex fraction, which means that this in, in a more horizontally written fashion would be two pi over one divided by one over three. Keep change flip, which means that the flipped version, that this would be changed to multiplication, three would be up here, and then there would be a one down there. And the effect on the period is that P would be equal to six pi. What does that mean? It means um, one complete wave occurs over six pi. Normally, it would be just two pi. Right? It would be a lot shorter. So what does that mean? It means that this is stretched without it's implying that. We could tell that it would be stretched anyway, because there's a, a rather than the B value being one, it's a fraction. All right. A couple of things to remember. Um, I'm going to put this here just to complete this thought. The period is six pi. All right. All right. If B is equal to one third, like as in uh, transformation models from chapter three, right? When you have a fraction, uh, this causes a horizontal stretch rather than a compression, right? That's implying that anyway, all right? 
because it's a fraction. Right? If you had a whole number that was just one, it would have, or something bigger than one, it shouldn't there make it squash. It should compress it. Right? But this will sort of look to elongate the wave. Right? In addition to shifting it over. Um, now as for the C value, in the factored form, you should get pi, right? This is the C value. Right. So this would be equal to pi, right? It's negative pi, so it's um, positive pi. Right. Because remember that's counterintuitive. Alright. Alright, in theory, if you had used this formula, um, C over B, and you had put in uh, what it was originally, which was pi over 3, right? And what you concluded B to be, B to B, 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 uh, one third, right? And you have pi over 3 divided by one-third, and the effect again is to keep change flip, which means that this would become a three up here, there would be a cross cancellation, and you'd end up with pi. Yeah. Alright, in theory, If C equals pi, then that would be where the waves start. Right? At pi, right? so positive, was it? So minus here. It's annoying because it's counterintuitive. Right? Um, the way, uh, pardon me, the end of the wave, I know you're not asked to do that per se. But just as another thought here, right? If the wave starts at pi, then the start plus the period should equal the end, right? So if the start is pi and the period is six pi, then the end would be it ends at seven pi. Right? I'm going to put this in my calculator and see if that is true. So let me put that in here, clear out the stuff that is in there, and on to that. I expect that the wave is not vertically shifted because there's no D, right? But I do expect the amplitude to be squatter than standard cosine because the amplitude is just half that much, right? There's going to be a distortion horizontally. It'll be stretched because there is a B value that's other than one. And there's also a horizontal shift. So it's going to be squatter, scooted over, and stretched. Right? So I'm going to put this in like so. One over two. I have to do with this orientation right now. I'm going to write it backwards. Uh, da -da -da. I'm just going to put it in that general form and see what we get. All right. Uh, this looks like it's entered correctly. Taking this and typing it into here, see what we get for a graph. Graph. 
You may have to tinker with the zoom sometimes. Yeah, that's kind of annoying. Ugh. <laughs> that is a dreadful picture. You can see that it's rather stretched though, right? Um, let me try different settings here. Uh, I might try zoom in. And you may do it several times if, if possible. No, that's not doing that great. Uh, try, let's see. Let's start with that again. Z trig. You can clearly see it would be elongated, especially if I put in the standard cosine here just underneath it. Cosine of x. There's your standard cosine, right? Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to remove it now because I don't want it to get too cumber encumbering. But you can see that it's, eh, it is what it is. Uh, I'm going to take this out delete that go back here all right and now uh, just confirm my suspicions here I mean it's obvious that since the vertical scale is just um, I want to say that that's one and that's negative one there this is halfway for the amplitude all right because of the uh, the a value here But it is also distorted, all right? So if my uh, assumptions are correct, right? This is a cosine, which means if you look for the high point here, which would be about there, I wanna say, that that should be at the location of pi, all right? All right. Rather than what it normally is, the high point begins usually at what? At zero, right? Maybe I should put that back. Um, just for comparison's sake. Here's cosine of x. Here's cosine where it normally starts, right? Um, it's the high, it starts at a high point rather than the middle, all right? So it would be normally one, right? And instead the high point of what appears to be this curve here is two increments in, which I want to bet that that's probably 90 and that's pi there. So if you can think of, instead of it starting here, it starts there, right? That should be the point of pi. So, ugh. graph please. All right, I'm gonna hit trace just to confirm. And we're on the right one, because it's the first function. I'm gonna put in second pi, and it should be at 0.5, all right? All right, there's the maximum there. Yep, a half. All right, there you have it. Okay. That, if that is the start, although it's off the screen, and it may give me an error message because of the nature of this, um, but the end point should, in theory, be 7 pi because it's so stretched. All right. So I'm going to try and see if it gives me at least a figure, right, even if it doesn't show me it. Um, second... Well, let me, let me put in seven first, seven, and now I'll put in the pi. And it should be, because of the nature of cosine, it should be at 0.5 again later on, all right? All right, let's see. Oh, error message, and that's because of the dimensions of the screen. Uh, let me see if I can get this to fit. All right. Zoom. If necessary, you can go into window. I hate doing that, but you could force the uh, the scale this way to be beyond seven pi. Just that's if there's a reason that you're getting an S an error, an error message when you're checking calculation points. It's because it's not on the screen, even though it should be able to predict it doesn't. So uh, eh. on the x scale here. It goes to 6.15, it looks like. I'm gonna stretch this a little bit beyond that. Now, I can't remember offhand, but uh, if pi is 3.14 times seven, that'd be at least 21. 
So I'm going to, going to put in uh, 25 instead as the maximum. All right, and it should be okay. All right. Graph. That's a little bit better. All right, there's standard cosine. That's actually a much nicer picture, right? Just by changing the scale. Now watch what happens. If I hit uh, trace, right, and I'm on the correct one, this is the first one, and I put in uh, what I predict, which is seven pi, right? Well, here's regular pi to begin with, right? The, the uh, quasi start of the wave here. Trace, please. Um, second pi. 0.5, right? There's where it, is, where it is, more or less to start. The, if you analyze this curve, right, and it's a cosine, this other peak that's way over here, right? That is, again, the maximum of a half, right? On the Y scale. That is more or less the end point of one complete wave cycle. So my prediction is, again, that it should be seven pi. Let's see if that's correct. All right, so I'm going to put seven, and then second for pi, and it is. There you have it. All right, that's the maximum of 0.5, or otherwise known as a half here, and that's the other end of this one complete wave cycle from here to here. That is a cosine wave. All right, all right, that's kind of cool, right? Don't give up. All right, you can see, you know, I get run into trouble all the time. If your calculator gives you an error message, it isn't that you're doing something wrong necessarily, it just means that you need to change the scale, and it doesn't do it automatically always, at least not in the way that you would like. Um, let me share something else with you too, uh, before I move on. I'm gonna erase a little bit because I need the space. This B value, you, you're gonna use a calculator obviously, but this B value is something you could use, right, but uh, somewhat counterintuitively as well. If you wanted, right, um, if we think of the usual um, inputs as being zero pi, technically, pi over two, pi, um, three pi over two, and two pi, and so forth. All right. And we want to see where they would be instead on our scale here. All right. All right. If these are normally dots on our graph, on a cosine, right? Normal cosine dots, if you will, right? X equals zero, X equals 90, X equals 180, 270, 360. And you have a situation like this where there is uh, both uh, a horizontal stretch and a horizontal shift, right? The uh, order of operations would dictate that you're going to involve the, the compression factor, the stretch or compression factor first, and then add, all right? Uh, all right? So, add the C value. So, in a nutshell, all right, to each of these, all right, you're going to... Multiply by the reciprocal of B, because it's just the way it works. All right, so whatever is this, and then you're going to add uh, what you determine the C value to be. All right. All right. So if it is zero normally, all right, and we have determined that the B value is one third, if you put one third in what is a fraction to begin with, it ends up being three over one, ultimately. That's still zero, right? This cancels just because of the nature of it. And then the C value is plus zero, uh, C uh, plus pi. The start of the wave, which is normally at zero, becomes pi. 
all right? In theory, you could get the other points if you go through this process again. So um, if you had pi over two, and then again, you multiply by the reciprocal, it's just the way it is with the B values, it's annoying. And then you add again pi, all right, the C value. Um, the way that it works out when you put this fraction of one third here, all right, is that it ends up being uh, one over one over three, it ends up being three over one, all right? All right, so you end up with three pi over two, all right? And then you would add pi to that, all right? All right, which is three pi over two, plus if you use a common denominator, uh, it would be uh, two over two, because that's just one whole pi, all right? And then you could add the tops. This would be five pi over two, all right? Right, and you can calculate it for pi, for three pi, and that it will just jibe with what we already know, which is that the whole thing is stretched and shifted at the same time. However, the 90 degree mark, right, on this normal cosine, which would be the line, which would be zero for the y value, has now been stretched, right? So what was pi over two is now gonna be further down the pike at five pi over two, right? I'm gonna go back to the graph and test the theory because I can't help myself. What would have been that point stretched and scooted over should be there. So if I enter this figure into trace, it should give me y is equal to zero. Right. Um, let me take out the, uh, the nicer cosine, clear. Now, the one I wanted to go away didn't. All right, I gotta retype it, sorry. Butter fingers, I was getting in trouble here. Half cosine, just checking that I typed it correctly. Okay, here's the graph. Okay, here's the um, transformation model of this wave. All right, so I entered this again because I accidentally erased it. Um, here again is the high point, all right, which is at pi right there, all right, rather than at um, zero because it scooted over that much. My prediction is that um, what would have been the 90 degree mark, all right, which would have been the first dot after the dot here, should be instead at five pi over two. All right. So what I should get if I put this in trace here, five pi over two, is that y is equal to zero. So, um, and it should be right there, all right, where my finger point is. If that's the high point, that's the start, then this would be the first point of interest right after it, the zero line. So I'm gonna hit trace, right? And now I'm gonna put in five pi divided by two. And if all goes according to plan, y should be zero at that location. And it is, all right? If you wanted to calculate pi, all right, it's the same thing. It's going to be the original value that it would be in the cosine wave model, all right, times the reciprocal of B. It's weird that it has to be that way, but it, it, it's the only thing that works, all right. And then you add uh, where the C value start would be, you know, to accommodate that, okay. But do it in that order. Do the horizontal compression first, be doing this by hand rather than by calculator, and then horizontal shift, okay. The next one would be four pi, I believe. All right, um, if you look in the packet, I'm gonna skip six, 
because I think I spent too much time on that other stuff. Um, uh, let's look at example seven that's in this packet. All right, now that's the solution here too, if you, if you prefer to read that. All right, I'll turn this back on. in the lights again. Um, can I get rid of this, get rid of this thumbnail, all right, this sidebar, turn that up, ugh, I hate that, uh, well, eh, I really want to do seven, so, it's just not cooperating, right. now go away, all right, um, in the case of seven, all right, this is an example of you're going to try to write an equation based upon the picture. Right. So, um, to give you uh, some kind of a procedure, what I would do is um, let me just flash this, maybe it'd be easier than just toggling back and forth. Think about it this way, all right? Depending upon what you have, if you see that there's um, a function that starts more or less at the origin zero zero just go with the sine incarnation of this if it is something else if it doesn't seem to start at zero zero then go with cosine and it would be some kind of shifted version of it perhaps right. so I need a little bit of light uh, for seven that's six is a harder problem. We'll do this one. You could do it either way. But um, let's look at this as um, narrow the scope here. If The middle would be somewhere here, right? The starting point, if it were from the perspective of sine, if it was, say, there, and it ended there, if we're just narrowing our perspective to that one complete waveform, it isn't at zero, zero. It's scooted back. So you could use sine and then make some accommodation. All right? But perhaps, if instead you're looking at it that way, you're looking at it as a reflected cosine, and in which case, um, and also shifted, right? This would be an upside down cosine, right? Um, the starting point would be back here more or less and it would end more or less there, all right? I'm gonna go with cosine just because it isn't already going through um, zero, zero, right? So I'm gonna, as a sort of preliminary step, I'm gonna choose the model y equals a cosine bx minus c plus d, right? Uh, because uh, not starting, right, at origin, right? If it were, then I would have just went with sine, right? All right, now, uh, my suggestion is this. All right, go through this process. Find the midline first from the picture, then the amplitude, and then explore what the B is, and then calculate C last. All right. All right. So, let's do midline D. All right. uh, 
And we could use a formula which might be pr practical. Right? I'll use the picture to validate, but the formula would be the midline is the maximum, which is easier to read, plus the minimum divided by two. Right? So it would appear that the maximum in any one of these cases of reading that's a max, and that's a max, and that's a max, because it's periodic, and it should be consistently the same, it's not dampening like sound waves, it's one. All right. So I'm going to put in place of the maximum in the formula, one. All right. The minimum would be at least either one of these two if you read them. It would be negative five, it seems to be. All right. So minus five. And therefore, we want one minus five, which would be negative four. And then you divide that by two. And therefore, the midline should be negative two, which um, already validates the suspicion that this is somehow shifted, right? So it appears to be um, elongated, but on top of that, it shifted at, by the way, I scribbled on it, a midline of negative two, right? This isn't part of the wave, it's more or less like the middle of the wave, right? So y equals negative two, right? In the model, that means that you would, you would very intuitively would put minus two there, okay? It's only the C that you have to, you know, the sign is counterintuitive. Right, now, um, the uh, amplitude A is something that you also can deduce from examining the midline. Right. But you might just use a formula anyhow. So it would be half times max minus min. Right. And the uh, maximum is still one. And the min is still negative five. Right. So you're gonna put in uh, one here and negative five here, but because of the nature of this formula, there's a double negative. So you have really one plus five, right? Which means you really have six, right? And then it's a half of that. So this would be uh, three, right? So you're gonna put three in place of A. Now, you would decide whether it's vertically reflected or not, right? At least given the standard version of a cosine, right? Cosine ordinarily, has a peak like this, right? Um, if you want to say that this is the same number as that particular uh, point, as that particular point just uh, shifted and vertically stretched and also reflected, you could say that it is negative, right? If you are, uh, you know, okay with that, all right? It's not gonna be wrong, but you will have to make some other changes perhaps, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and say, Right. If, if this is what I'm going to regard, if this is a starting point in my mind, right, just like this would normally be the starting point, all right, then it's definitely a negative from that perspective, in making that argument. All right. So a negative three. All right. All right. Um, Let's look for B. Right. I'll put uh, B here, three. B, all right, is something you can get from this, that is, again, the, uh, the horizontal compression or stretch factor, all right? This could be calculated from two pi, because that's normal, the period for cosine. It goes from zero to two pi under normal circumstances, divided by the period. Now, the period is not given, but if you stare at the graph, you can figure it out, right? 
if this is the start of a wave, and I'm going to say that this is the end of one complete wave, all right, what is the difference Just estimating here on the the horizontal scale, right? If this is about negative two, right, and this is positive four, what is the distance from here to here horizontally? That's the period that it would take. Remember, this is the period is the amount of pi. They didn't put the pi symbols, but those that, these numbers that are you know one, three, five. That's, and pi is 3.14 is, they're the same thing, all right? It's the same scale, all right? That is a distance of six, all right? All right. So you would put a six in here, all right? And then you already have to divide that by two pi, right? And divide it into that, all right? That means that B is equal to pi over three. And you could put that, um, since it's just B, right, right there, pi over 3. Okay? And then the last thing is the C value. It would be difficult just reading this picture. Um, but it's not impossible. I, mean, I drew it a little bit crooked here. This is the starting point, basically. What we're going to do in this case is we're going to use this incarnation of C here, right, the factored form, and then if necessary, distribute the B value which calculated, all right, um, to figure out what C is, all right, so that it goes in the general model rather than in the factored form. So, um, let's see. C, the horizontal shift, all right, which again you can think of as being sort of the starting point, all right, appears to be at, I'm sorry, I went to sleep again, it appears to be at negative two. All right. All right. So if I borrow this, right, and I hope that, that my cup is not in the way yet, right? Okay. And I put in negative two, all right, and then I insert this B value of pi over three that I've calculated. This is again a complex fraction. It's a fraction on top of a fraction. Um, I'll move this. All right. In the more horizontal orientation, it would be negative two divided by pi over three. Oh, no, you don't want to make it a boo boo. Forgive me. All right. I'm going to start with this the factored form. Right. Because the factored form, in the event of having a horizontal stretch, and there apparently is a horizontal stretch here, is to your benefit to read that as the starting point from that perspective. So if you have b times x. Um, uh, minus C over B, this version of it, right? We're going to get from this, we're going to get just C by itself so that we can put it in the standard version, right? So what is here is the value in the drawing. Right? So the starting point is on the x-axis, negative 2. So 
negative 2 in place of that ratio. The b value is pi over 3, right? now distributed. Right? If you distribute pi over 3 to x, then you get pi over 3 of x. If you distribute pi over 3 of x times what essentially is going to end up being positive 2 right, in the drawing, then you end up with positive 2 pi over 3. Okay. All right. And that means, all right, just to make this a little bit easier to read, all right, and I'll put it in function notation, this model in standard presentation, rather than in facted form, which is what you need when you're trying to figure out C, um, is this. All right. Negative 3 cosine of pi over 3x plus 2 pi over 3 minus 2. Okay. Right. Again, this isn't the only way to write this, but this is the way that it would intuitively be to me. Right? Just based upon the, this idea. This is how cosine should ordinarily look. Ordinarily look. And is a good strategy. If you are what appears to be the beginning of a wave, if it does not start at the origin, go with the cosine. Okay. Alright, right. one more of these and then I'll stop as I'm over two hours here. Alright, if you look at nine. We're going to follow the instruction basically. I'm going to put that paper. Here. All right. When we do this one, that you're graphing something that's already given to you, basically follow this procedure. All right. That's down here. For number nine, we're going to follow what's in these yellow bars or orange, orange bars. Okay. The given function, I'll put it here just to make it a little bit easier to see. If you were to sketch a graph of f of x, and you're going to use a calculator, really, because you don't have graph paper like this. Um, three sine of pi over four times x minus pi over four. Right? And we can compare it again to a model as amplitude sine b of x minus c plus d. We could see what is missing right? and what is present. That's a minus. A preliminary step would be um, switch from factor form you know to the general or standard what you want to call it general form which it already is. Um, then that one. The second thing would be to find A. What is A? Alright. Well, what is sitting in place of A is positive 3, which implies a couple of things. It's a positive, right, so um, hasn't been reflected right. vertically. And it's a 3 
and it's intuitive when you're dealing with the amplitude so that it is uh, taller than usual, right? Because what is it normally? The amplitude is normally one, right? So it's three times as large, okay? So expect it to be stretched, right? Vertically stretched. Um, I'll sort of uh, draw a little shift, makeshift picture here. Right. If this is normally how sine looks, right, then already, right, just based upon this three here, even if it was in the same location, it would be much larger like that. Okay. Um, Let's calculate the period, which would be um, 2 pi over b. Right. The b value in this case is um, what's attached to x, so it's pi over 4. Okay. So I'm going to slip in, um, superimpose pi over 4 would be, would be in the formula, and remember, this is really 2 pi over 1 divided by pi over 4, which keep change flip means that this ends up being multiplied by 4 over pi, and therefore there would be a cross cancellation effect, and you just end up with 8, right, the period is 8, right, it means, meaning, um, one wave over eight, um, eight point zero right, on the x scale. Right. If again pi is three point one four, right, right, normally it would be two pi, which is three point one four. So this is going to imply something. This implies that it's horizontally stretched. You could tell that anyway. This is a, a figure here rather than the number one, right? This is horizontally stretched. Right. So, um, to add to this, this is going to be elongated. You know. All right. Let's figure out a phase shift, more or less the starting point on top of it, because there's a figure here. Um, four, all right, I'll use black just to be consistent. Four. Um, because there's a number here other than one, I'm gonna look at this in the, um, I'm gonna use this figure. C over B. Right. And I'll fit in what I can, right, which is that the B component is still pi over 4, right, and the C component is what's sitting here. Right. Since it's counterintuitive and it's a minus normally, and it's minus here, you don't have to worry about the sign. Right. So it's essentially uh, pi over 4 over pi over 4, which even if you reoriented it like this, all right, it would end up, of course, canceling a lot, because it would be 4 on top and uh, pi on the bottom, and everything would simplify down to 1, which means that the C value ultimately is going to be uh, 1. Um, that ratio, anyhow. The horizontal shift, right, uh, is going to be towards the right, if it's positive one, right, uh, be towards the right, right, one space. Alright, this, you can think of this as basically being start at x equals positive one, right? 
so in addition to being stretched out, right, um, the, it would be scooted over. Right? So a lot going on here. All right? It's not vertically flipped, right? but it is definitely taller. It is definitely stretched and it is shifted. So if you figure out this way, uh, just to make a, a prediction, I'm using my calculator ultimately, because I don't have graph paper. Um, if this is uh, zero and this is pi over two, all right, pi and this is pi right here. All right? If pi is 3.14, right, and pi over two would be half of that, so one point, I think it's five, seven, like that. Uh, just checking clear. clear. Here's pi divided by two for the 90 degree mark. It's the decimal pi over two, the 90 degree mark is 1.57. Then if it starts at one, you would have to figure that although it would normally start at zero, it would have to be somewhere between 0 and 1.57. So your start would be something like this. Not quite there, right? And then like that, right? A complete wave. If you wanted to calculate the end, again, I know they didn't really ask you to do that, but just to make a prediction. If you know the starting point and you know the period, all right, uh, just for the sake of space, I'll put it here. the end of one complete wave All right, would be equal to the start, more or less, quasi-start if you will, plus the period. Right. So if the start is one and the period is eight, right, then the end would be at the decimal point 9.0, sorry. Right. So if you figure one pi is 3.14, this would be uh, just shy of uh, three pi, right? So, you know, two pi and some change, right? For the other end of this wave, this first wave, right? Let us enter this in our calculators to confirm those suspicions there. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to go here, clear out the junk that is in there. I'm going to type this nicely before I show it to you, just so I don't type it backwards again. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, here it is entered. Uh, and this is the original uh, given function without the picture, of course. Um, and if I have to tinker with the screen dimensions, I will, but let's just see if it, I'll uh, try all up here. Okay. All right. That's a nice wave. Okay. All right. The starting point, and this is, bear in mind, a sign, all right? So normally a sign would start here, right, at the origin, right? Instead, it's scooted over by a, a minuscule amount. And if that increment is, in fact, pi over 2, then in decimal form, it would be 1.57. So I'm going to hit second. Well, let me do that. Let me just hit trace to get on the wave. All right, and now I'm going to input the, uh, what we predict the starting point to be, which is 1. <laughs> All right, if I enter 1, then the y value should be 0 right at that location, right here where the shadow of my finger is. All right, so I'm going to put 1 in here, and I get y is 0. So that is the new start, if you will, All right, of a wave. All right, the end of the wave should be, in theory, right there. All right? Normally it would be a 2 pi, but it's elongated, right? 
So let's see if this is correct. Now I predict it to be 9, right, is the end of the wave. So if I put in 9, then the, the cursor should move to this location. Uh, I'm sorry, there, right? And uh, that should be y equals 0 at x9. So I'm going to put in 9 here. And there you have it. And I wonder why it's giving me that tiny little mark there. That's weird, right? That's very strange. Three times ten to the negative thirteenth would be practically zero. <laughs> but hey, I don't know why it's overcomplicating it that way. Maybe I entered something screwy here. Right. Uh, graph trace. Well, as you can see, I'm not sure why it's giving me such a tiny decimal instead. Um, but that's definitely y equals zero. <laughs> so if this is the beginning, that is indeed the end, right? And that should be the equivalent of y equals zero. Okay. I might, maybe it has something to do with the screen dimensions that I screwed around with. Zero. Here's a slightly different view. All right, I zoomed out a little bit on this one. Here's the start again, there's the end. All right, it's still nine, and, you know. Y, X is equal to nine, and uh, this should really be reading as Y equals zero, because uh, evidently, look where it is, all right. Um, maybe this thing's getting old. <laughs> I hope not. Um, let me put in one, and it goes back to where it's supposed to be, zero. You could crawl along. Ding, 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 ding. There you go. And dum, 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 dum. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. Okay. All right. Uh, we're at two and a quarter. Okay. All right. Thank you. This video again was for Monday. All right. I'll see you again on Tuesday. Your homework would just be from section eight one. Thank you guys for listening. Be careful out there.